Good evening, everyone. I'm Jane Pointer. On this episode of AZ Illustrated Science, we learn how some members of Tucson's clergy are going the extra mile to help members of their congregation cope with mental illness. Also, we examine the practice of cord blood banking and why some medical experts say saving newborn stem cells is a kind of health insurance for the future. But first, here's a look at today's top stories. Senator Jeff Flake made his first floor speech today. He used the opportunity to counsel the other 99 members of the Senate to stay away from partisanship. Now is not the time, Mr. President, Madam President, for this institution to retreat into irrelevance. Where the sum of our influence is to sign off on another continuing resolution to fund the government for another six months. Where success is measured by how well our tracks are covered when the debt ceiling is raised where prioritizing spending cuts are avoided by invoking another sequester. No, we've been there, done that. It's time now for the Senate to lead. In recent weeks, the left has attacked Flake for his vote on the universal background check bill, saying in that case he put party first with the vote. Meanwhile, on the other side of the U.S. Capitol, Arizona Secretary of State Ken Bennett testified today on a bill requiring states to ask people who apply for new driver's licenses whether they also want to change their voter registration. Bennett told a House committee Arizona already shares voter registration information with 22 other states and as a result has prosecuted a number of people for voting in two states for president or other offices. And after weeks of negotiations and threats, the state budget is once again moving through the legislative process in Phoenix. Today, House Speaker Andy Tobin announced the budget, including the governor's Medicaid expansion, will get a committee vote this week. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Repeat studies show that people experiencing a mental health issue are more likely to turn to their clergy than a doctor. Now Tucson's clergy are working to learn more about mental illness and developing new ways to respond. Gisela Tellis has the story. Put your arm around the person next to you and we join in singing Shalom Aleichem. When times are hard, many people turn to their faith for strength and comfort. But in the wake of the recession and the loss of about half of Arizona's funding for mental health services over the past five years, some of Tucson's faith communities started to see people coming in for a different reason, says Karen McDonald, faith community engagement manager for Tucson's Interfaith Community Services. And then we'll give it to the congregations. I think both the congregations and ICS, Interfaith Community Services, are, are um, seeing more folks calling us for assistance, what, to know what the resources are, where can they turn. The shift has left many faith leaders at a loss. What could you do to our health advocacy? Probably the most poignant interaction we had with a faith leader uh, about a, a year or so ago before we started this whole effort was when a second person in their congregation um, took their own life. And he said to us, what are we not doing? Faith communities have always played a role in mental health. National surveys have consistently shown that more people turn to their clergy when they experience a mental health issue than to psychiatrists or doctors. But the clergy may not always know how to respond. McDonald saw a growing desire among Southern Arizona's faith leaders to learn more about mental illness, and she felt compelled to help. Churches and synagogues. She started by organizing the state's first conference on faith communities and mental illness in April 2012. It sold out, packing its venue with more than 450 people eager for answers. For some people of faith, to have a mental illness, first of all, is a thing of shame, and so it's just not talked about. And so that's probably the biggest challenge, and probably not just in the faith community, is, is starting to break that silence and remove the shame around that and the guilt around that. The demand to break that silence hasn't abated. ICS continues to hold forums on mental health topics and offers a mental illness resource kit for any faith community that asks for one. 
for MacDonald, who is herself an ordained minister, fighting the stigma that surrounds mental illness is part of being true to her faith. For me, it's imperative that communities and people of faith be who they say they are. And that is a place of compassion and support and growth for anybody who would come. The, the originators of all of our faiths teach us that. Will you seek to honor God? In the push to make faith communities more aware of mental health issues and more welcoming to those who live with them isn't just coming from faith leaders. It's also growing out of the congregations themselves. At St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, church member Karen Andrews is bringing bipolar disorder out of the shadows. The stigma can only be broken with knowledge and with compassion, and that's what's happening here at St. Andrew's Church. Andrews has struggled with bipolar disorder from early childhood on. For decades, she kept it under wraps, managing her mood swings on her own while working as a nurse and raising a family, she says. But one day, I went to work and I couldn't stop crying. I had no idea what was happening. It just hit me like that. And so I left work, went to my doctor, and he immediately phoned a psychiatrist. So I went there, and he immediately put me in the hospital. And I was in there for a month. And they finally, they said, well, we know what's wrong with you. And that was a great relief for me. With a diagnosis, Andrews was finally able to get treatment and find stability. Now she wanted to share what she'd learned with others. She sought a home for the support group she envisioned, one that would actually teach the coping skills that had helped her make peace with her bipolar disorder. That was when she found St. Andrews. I didn't know it until just recently. One Sunday, we were getting ready to walk out after service, and Pastor Carla Williams was out in the narthex greeting people, and she you know, saw us, came up to us, and just started talking with us. And she was interested in knowing, you know, about our previous church experiences. And I had just mentioned that I had pretty recently done a support group for people who had bipolar disorder. And her eyes got big, and she said, really? <laughs> and she began to tell me about the Carey ministry that they have here at St. Andrews, and that one of their concerns here is finding a way to reach out to those who are have mental illness. And so it really, it was a very, you know, serendipity moment, if you can call it that. It was a God thing. The 11-week course is now in its second year, and interest in it is growing. St. Andrew's pastor, Carla Williams, says the program has become a way for the church to reach out and better serve the community. It raised our awareness that we really are a place where people come looking for comfort. I'm sure they're looking for hope. Uh, often mental illnesses drive people into hopelessness, despair, and suicide. And the gospel is the gospel of hope. Hope is now Karen Andrews' mission. She was crossing down in the desert. We have genetic mistakes all the time. That's what bipolar happens to be. But God loves us unconditionally. And that's how he wants us to love each other and care for one another. Whenever we see somebody who has a mental illness, we have a special calling to reach out because they are God's children, just as I am, just as you are. To answer that calling, she says, is the greatest expression of faith. The latest research on the link between spirituality and wellness is revealing a complex picture, one that challenges the beliefs of many psychiatrists and physicians. Here to explain this is Dr. Lynn Climo, a University of Arizona assistant professor of psychiatry. So what does research tell us about the link between spirituality and wellness? 
Well, uh, there's been a lot of research going on for uh, quite a few years, actually. Um, recent research as well as older research. Uh, there's a lot of research been done on religion versus spirituality. Um, most of the research has been done on religion, actually. Um, can I tell you the difference first? Sure, go yes, go right um, ahead. First, uh, religion, a lot of the studies have been done on religious attendance. So people that actually go to religious services. So when you think about religion, you think about our major religions like Christianity, uh, Judaism, uh, various uh, Muslim now is in the news a lot. So you're thinking about an organized system, a place where you go to church, you have a fellowship, you have a hierarchy um, of a place where you learn the rules of living life. Um, spirituality is a much more uh, personal uh, relationship that you might have with something that you feel connected to. So it's a more personal um, relationship with whatever you believe in. Okay, so then how are you finding that this is actually affecting people's wellness and is there a difference between the two? Well, they're actually trying to separate out the two now. The studies that have been done with religious attendance, um, there's over 850 studies done on religious attendance, and they have shown lots of positive effects. They've shown decrease in blood pressure. They've shown people are exercising more. They've been showing people are um, able to cope better with life. They're showing that they're doing better nutrition. They're also showing um, uh, about a 25% better predictive value for people in not developing anxiety and depression. Suicide rates are going down. People don't use chemicals like um, alcohol or drugs as often. Um, they're also showing with psychosis, uh, people are uh, coping with their psychosis. Now this is where some of the complexity comes in. And I know I haven't answered fully your question yet, but let me come back to that because um, the the, the separation between spirituality and religion is difficult. Religion, it's easy because do they go to church or do they not go to church? We can measure that. Spirituality, it's how they actually believe something and what they, they give meaning to. So how do you measure this though? So when we do studies, and I'm actually not a researcher, I read the research, so when we're, when we're looking at spirituality, we have to ask different kinds of questions. We're asking questions like, what are you um, attributing meaning to in your life? Um, the, the separating out of um, not just do you feel sad, do you feel happy, do you feel a sense of well-being, but do you feel these things in relationship to what you believe in and what you attribute meaning to? And it could be a god or it could be something like nature, like a Native American belief system. And how do we know, how, do, how does research, uh, the research that's been done know that in, in the few seconds that we have left here, that it is actually the spirituality and, and the religion that's, that's having the effect on wellness and, and not necessarily perhaps the emotional state. We had Dr. Sternberg in here recently talking about the huge effect on, on location and on emotions and that kind of thing on, on wellness. Well, there's a lot of people doing studies by putting people in brain scans, for example, PET scans. Um, they're looking, uh, doing EEGs. So they're trying to find this, quote, God spot. Um, and they're looking at people that have had brain injuries and looking at, uh, at something called a transcendent trait. So they're able to now, with some of our technology, look at like the uh, Carmelite nuns or the Buddhist monks. And they're actually looking at this on some of our technology. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. President Obama moved today to fill three empty seats on a powerful federal appeals court, setting the stage for a confrontation with Senate Republicans over the nominations. We look at the fight over the president's candidates for the court and the broader issue of judicial vacancies. Then top military brass face tough questions today over sexual assaults in the armed forces. We examine potential fixes on the table. Paul Salman gets the first of two takes on government intervention in the economy. Tonight, former Reagan budget chief David Stockman argues against bailouts in his new book, The Great Deformation.
When we bailed out GM, the only thing we did was move 40,000 jobs from below the Mason-Dixon line, where they would have been produced in Hyundai plants, to north of the Mason-Dixon line. It was all about the Electoral College. It was not about jobs. And we close with a conversation with a storm chaser about the science and potentially deadly risks of seeking out extreme weather. Right now, it's gotten to the point in which there are too many people out there. We go out and try to make measurements with our radars, and sometimes we can't find a parking space out in a, in a very rural area. And that's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. Medgar Evers was killed for fighting to dismantle Jim Crow. Fifty years later, his widow says that sacrifice was worth it. He did believe in America. He did believe in Mississippi. And he wanted to be a positive force for change. And that has happened. Medgar Evers' legacy on the next morning edition from NBR News. The science of cord blood is changing rapidly as researchers study new ways to use stem cells taken from umbilical cord blood to treat what are, right now, untreatable conditions. While some caution that paying to bank cord blood is an unnecessary expense, because the science is still too new, others say scientists will find innovative and important uses for cord blood, making it logical to save it now. Georgia Davis tells us the story of Jessica Schaefer, a mother who decided to save her son's cord blood and is now using it as part of a clinical trial. Logan is an inquisitive three-year-old who, like many boys his age, loves to play with action figures and video games. But unlike most boys, Logan faces some serious health challenges. He was born 10 weeks early and, as a result, has cerebral palsy, a brain disorder that causes problems with movement, muscle tone and posture, and is often linked to intellectual disabilities, vision and hearing problems, and seizures. People need to understand that even though he's different, he's still this, you know, a special guy and he has his own little personality. Logan is taking part in a clinical study to see if his own stem cells can be used to treat his condition. Logan's stem cells were taken from the blood in his umbilical cord right after he was born. I actually didn't even think that I was going to need them at all. I just went ahead and did it because it was a service that was available to me and you never know when you're going to need them. Logan is an exceptional case. Because of his risky delivery, he was enrolled in the Newborn Possibilities program, which was set up to help at-risk newborns by paying the fee for collecting and banking their stem cells. Advocates and critics alike agree that this group stands to gain the most from cord blood banking. However, at-risk children are not the only ones who might benefit. Cord blood stem cells are currently being used to treat more than 80 serious diseases, including various types of leukemia, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and sickle cell disease. And clinical trials are studying using stem cells to treat conditions such as juvenile diabetes, traumatic brain injury, autism, and cerebral palsy. We have over 450,000 samples stored currently. Uh, we are also the largest cord blood bank in the world. Cord Blood Registry, or CBR, was started in 1995 in Tucson. While private banks now exist around the world, CBR was the first of its kind. When Cord Blood Registry was founded, and for probably the first 10 years that we were in existence, the primary use for these samples were really the types of things that you consider bone marrow to be used for these days, you know, blood disorders, cancer-type situations. And what's really happened over the last five to seven years is the advent of regenerative medicine and these cord blood stem cells, these newborn stem cells being utilized to treat children not for necessarily life-threatening types of situations. They're more for impairments that obviously impact the quality of that child's life and that family's life. Banks are classified as either public or family. Public banks store donated cord blood samples that anyone can use if the sample is a match. Family banks are private. They store a newborn cells for later use by that individual or a close relative for a fee. CBR charges $2,000 upfront for collecting, processing, and shipping the cord blood stem cells, and then $135 per year after that to store the samples, just in case. 
You don't like to think about your child having some type of neurological deficit. You don't like to think about the fact that your child may you know, be faced with a drowning type situation. You don't want to think about the fact that your child may have autism. And that they're not necessarily things that you can predict. There are some instances in which you know, physicians are able to identify an in utero stroke. And so that's a perfect opportunity to go ahead and collect that child's core blood. Samples are stored in Dewar's 9,000 gallon tanks. Sensors monitor the level of liquid nitrogen in each Dewar, automatically adding more when needed to keep the inside temperature hovering around a frigid negative 196 degrees Celsius. CBR is different from other private banks, however, in that it does more than store cord blood. It actively promotes using newborn stem cells for research. The opportunities for using these samples really are endless. As more researchers want to investigate the use of cord blood stem cells for um, treatment of you know, whatever their particular disease or impairment of choice is, more and more of these samples are going to be used. Private cord blood banking is often referred to as a kind of biological insurance. It costs parents money and the cells will not necessarily be needed, leading some to caution parents against footing the bill for storing their child's stem cells. Swingle, however, says banking cord blood stem cells is about preserving possibilities for the future. And these cells can only be captured once, at the time the child is born. It's a bit of a catch-22. With regenerative medicine um, at this point, the child, you need to have access to that child's own cord blood stem cells to then be able to be used for these types of impairments and these types of treatments. On this point, Jessica Schaefer agrees. You don't really think that your child's going to have anything wrong with them and until as they start getting older and you're seeing that they're not making their milestones and they're really far behind, that's when you start to realize that there might be something wrong with your child. Even though Jessica was initially nervous about banking her son's stem cells for use in clinical research. I see, oh, I see it. Whoa. She says the result has been the possibility of a brighter future for her son. He wouldn't even have a chance um, for a better quality of life without this program. But not only that, it's going to help um, other kids. And that is what Jessica Schaefer and Kristen Swingle say cord blood stem cell research is all about, creating opportunities for studies now that can ultimately help children in the future. Jessica and her son Logan took part in the Newborn Possibilities Program, which helps parents facing the prospect of having a child with a severe medical condition to bank that child's cord blood stem cells at no cost. Tucson Medical Center piloted this program, and Dr. Hugh Miller is here to tell us more about the program and how it helped to foster new stem cell research. Thank you for being here. So this must be an incredible light of ray of hope for parents who have a child with a severe medical condition. What does the research say about that? What really can they expect from this? Yeah, so the Newborn Poss Possibilities Program was really designed to help exactly the parents that you describe. The problem is that many of these children seem quite normal when their fetuses go on to be born and then in the years that follow develop quite severe neurologic d disabilities. Probably the most notable is cerebral palsy. We don't know exactly what causes it. We know several of the factors that contribute to complicating a pregnancy that will ultimately result in a child that develops cerebral palsy. So because there is no cure for cerebral palsy, there is even no definitive treatment that really can restore a child to some semblance of normal life, we embarked on this program to collect cord blood in the hope that it might be used for these children later in life to restore their neurologic condition to normal, or at least some semblance of normal, that they, so that a child who otherwise would have been wheelchair bound could now be walking, running, playing, um, and um, participating. So, so are you saying that we've actually have research that says 
Um, despite other cures, we think that this might actually be a possible, possible cure for these children. There is animal evidence. There is animal evidence that when you cause a deficit in an animal and you infuse that animal with stem cells, that that deficit can be um, healed, if you will, um, or restored um, in the setting of those stem cells. And there is anecdotal evidence in humans that children that suffered quite debilit I shouldn't say children, fetuses that suffered quite debilitating injury in utero when infused with their cord blood later in life, return to a normal state or some semblance of a normal state. That's astonishing. So, so what's the next step? If you've got animal uh, studies, uh, when are we likely to see anything in humans, human research? Well, there, are, in fact, are two randomized trials right now, one going on in Atlanta, Georgia, or Augusta, Georgia, and the other one going on um, at Duke that are testing this hypothesis in humans. The problem with this kind of study is unlike many other studies where you give a drug or you give a medication, this is a very unique treatment that requires a very unique source. And that source is these stem cells. And to be able to have these children participate in a study, you have to have their cord blood sitting in reserve for the very children that are going to need their cord blood. Oh, this is really thinking ahead. So the Newborn Possibilities Program was undertaken to identify children, again fetuses, at very high risk, who as a fetus didn't have a problem, but because it was, because they were relegated to a group that was likely to develop a problem, we systematically collected their cord blood under an algorithm that I helped develop and banked that blood for the future when and if they would need that cord blood. And, and the program now, do, can, can people get involved still? What, what's going on with the program? The program was, um, to a large extent, ended in um, December um, of 2011. The children, that under, the children for whose blood was collected are still participating in the program. There is a residual um, group that can still participate um, in a very limited um, portion of the algorithm. But for the most part, a lot of that funding has now been um, lost. And um, hopefully, this um, initial wave of children will uh, set the stage for vast numbers of children being able to do this in the future. And what happens with their blood now? Is it going to be part of a, a research uh, program, or, or, or what happens next? So that blood is being banked for these families for free for five years, because it's in those first five years that the most uh, that most of these children will manifest illness and or disability. Um, beyond that, the families have the option to assume the responsibility for the banking and the cost of the banking if they choose to. And who funded it originally? S Cord Blood Registry, or CBR. I see. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming in and, and telling us about this uh, really important subject. Well, thank you. It is an important subject, and, you know, the promise of this treatment is not yet fully realized, but it could be a, it could be a game changer if, uh, if these children really do benefit. That's our show. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, go online to our website at azpm.org. I'm Jane Pointer. Thanks for watching.